ahead and get started with the webinar. Um, and we're starting out with bio, so hopefully everyone um, that still has to join won't miss too much. So hi everyone, this is uh, Shreya Patasamayhan, and today we are going to be hosting a panel discussion on bioethics and big data. So during this conversation, we're gonna run through some of the big questions and ethical concerns that health information networks and exchanges have been facing over the last few years and are currently um, facing today. I'm gonna to take just a brief moment to introduce myself and then introduce my fellow panelists. So as I mentioned, this is Shrey Patel. I am the Chief Policy and Privacy Officer at MyHen. I've been with the organization for a little over three years and I'm an attorney by trade, but I really handle all things public pri policy, um, privacy, and then spend a good portion of my time with our internal legal team as well. Today, I'm gonna to be moderating the panel, but I'm also gonna participate in the conversation just to give the Michigan perspective in addition to the other two individuals that we're gonna be hearing from today. Nick, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So on today's panel, um, Ammon Fillmore will be joining us. He is general counsel and the privacy officer for the Indiana Health Information Exchange. So I've worked with Ammon in other working groups, so I can um, confidently say that he is an expert and a leader in the field, uh, particularly when it comes to tracking with some of these policy changes that we've seen. Prior to joining Indiana Health Information Exchange, or IHI, he worked um, in compliance in Japan. Um, he worked in the office of um, the U.S. attorneys in Alaska as well, so he's definitely um, been all over. He also has a Master's of Health Administration in addition to his JD, so we're just very excited he's able to join us and give us his insight on some of these areas. Can you go to the next slide? And then also joining us today is going to be um, Dr. Harm Sherpier. He is currently the Chief Medical Information Officer at HealthShare Exchange, which is the highly reputable Philadelphia Regional Health Information Exchange. So in addition to his role at HealthShare X, he sure serves as an adjunct professor at the Jefferson College of Population Health, where he teaches health informatics and population health analytics. And prior to holding these roles, he was the Chief Medical Information Officer at Maine Healthline, um, which was an integrated network where he was responsible for the implementation of information systems and electronic patient records for physicians, nurses, and other clinicians. Um, Dr. Sherper was born and raised in the Netherlands, and that's also where he completed his medical training and his master's in medical informatics. So we're beyond thrilled to have him join our panel today, given his expertise and background, and um, we're undoubtedly gonna benefit from his unique viewpoints today. So Ammon and, and Dr. Shapir, is there anything that I missed or anything that you wanna add before we jump into some of the questions? It's an absolute pleasure to be here and, and join everyone and hopefully we can answer some questions and provide some valuable insight. Yes, sure, thank you. I have to be on this panel, looking forward to the discussion. And, and, and I want to add one thing to my bio is that, you know, the first time when I uh, spent a year in the United States was as an exchange student in Michigan. So I'm a big fan of Michigan. I consider it my, my U.S. home state and I'm very happy to be on a panel with a lot of Michigan people. So go blue. Yeah, um, he brought that up during our call yesterday and I was um, telling him that we typically have um, a annual conference that we put on that's in person. And so once um, all this COVID um, stuff is over, we're definitely gonna have to invite you back so you can Sign come and visit Michigan again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Nick, you can go on to the next slide and we'll just jump right into the content. So over the last two years, we have really seen an emphasis on helping patients easily access their health information. And this is something that is by no means a new concept. So under the HIPAA right of access, we know that patients are entitled to have access to their own healthcare information at little to no cost to them and with little to no effort. However, this well-established concept has been at the forefront of HHS's initiatives over the past two years. For example, um, we know that we saw it with the release of the CMS final interoperability rule that came out in 2020, and we saw it even more recently with the proposed changes to the HIPAA privacy rule that came out just one month ago. So my question um, to the two of you is, while many of these new requirements surrounding patient access are imposed on providers and payers, 
how has your health information network or health information exchange addressed patient access mandates or concerns? And Ammon, maybe we can start with you. Sure, so thank you. Um, when, when I think about this question, and, and I'll be brief, it reminds me of a bit of an anecdote, and uh, it's supposedly a true story, but nevertheless, I think a good one regarding Steve Jobs and the first iPod. And when the engineers brought him in the prototype to the iPod, uh, they said, Mr. Jobs, here's the, the prototype. This, this is as small as we can get it, a thousand songs in your pocket. And he looked at it and said, this is great, but it needs to be smaller. They said, well, Mr. Jobs, there's no way that we will ever be able to do this. Uh, we, we can't make it smaller. And uh, the story goes that he took it over to the fish tank in his office. He dropped it in there and bubbles started coming out. And he says, well, it sure looks like there's more space there. You need to make it smaller. Uh, and it forced them to, to, as they said, rethink how they entirely approach this. And so when I think about patient access, I feel a little bit like uh, someone dropped the prototype into the fish tank and they're just saying, look, I, I'm not sure how you need to do it, but you need to make it better. You, you need to improve this. And so there is no unifying playbook that, that we're following. And so we're all trying to do this and solve this uh, problem of how do we help the providers and payers from the HIE, HIM side to, to get them that data. And so where we've really tried to uh, focus our concern is saying, one, we may need to create new ways to approach this problem and really push us outside the comfort zone because we know what the end result needs to be, but there's no unifying playbook. And so for us, a lot of it has been really working with our providers to say, how can we create that infrastructure so when the provider or the payer creates that access for the patient, that it's not just siloed data from their particular institution because it doesn't do much good if a patient has five different portals for the five different providers that they go to. And that's not saying that the HIN is then necessarily the, the portal, but being able to push and exchange that information amongst those organizations brings that value to the actual patient portal. So it's almost a behind the scenes trying to make sure that we are connecting those silos. Absolutely, and, and Dr. Shapiro, do you have anything that you wanted to um, add on to that or a different perspective from the health share act side? Yeah, I, I, I would like that. So be, before I answer the question, let me just very briefly outline HSX health share exchange to Philadelphia regional uh, health information sure. exchange spans southeastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware. Um, large, almost all large hospitals and health systems are connected through HSX, are members of HSX. Many, many ambulatory practices. Um, most area payers and health plans are part of HSX. A lot of community organizations like Benefit Data Trust and MANA, a, a food security company, are, are, are part of HSX and share data both ways. So it's a very, very solid network. Um, we now collaborate also a lot with public health agencies, which I'm sure we'll talk about later as we talk about COVID. And um, our platform, our information system platform, is powered by NextGen, and that they uh, they do our uh, IT. The question you have is patient access. And I have to be honest, HSX today, it's mostly a broker between providers, provider to provider, and provider to payer, and payer to provider. Up until, uh, for now, we've said patients get access to the, their data directly from their providers, which of course has always been the meaningful use approach that's been, and, and that's been the technology setup. So most patients directly get their data through portals or through any other means, including downloading directly from their from their provider organization. And I think that is still continuing the way we do it. Now, I do think the Cures Act and the conditions of participation help and assist not only in having patients access, but also helping raise the bar on interoperability overall. So I think we're very excited to see those, um, those rules go into effect and, and help both the providers and, 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 the, and the health plans be more interoperable. And we feel that HSX is a vehicle to do that. We do have one other mechanism by which patients might be able to access their data, and that is through a, a um, subsidiary, which we call Market Street, where we um, allow apps of all kinds to tap into HSX data or other data. Those could be patient-facing apps. So, so we are in that sense open to, uh, to a lot of initiatives to say, if you're, if you're um, a vendor or a creator of patient-facing apps, 
either you know for any healthcare data or very specific for a specific diagnosis, that's where HSX would be able to be a platform to serve patient patient data into those apps. Um, that I think is is the best mechanism. I don't think that we are equipped or even able to do direct patient access to our data. We see ourselves more as a broker between the providers. That definitely makes sense, and I think that. From the Michigan perspective, we've taken a very similar approach. I think mm -hmm. that one thing that we have struggled with or one question that we grapple with a lot is how does the health information network or the health information exchange really fit into the landscape when it comes to patient access? And the reason for that is we are kind of uniquely positioned as this um, entity that sits kind of at the center of all these different healthcare systems, of all these um, providers and payers, and we're receiving all of this information or routing it from one point to another. So we are uniquely positioned. However, we might not be, you know, um, the best entity to actually accommodate the patient access itself. And that always comes up when we think about um, patient education and what's kind of a natural fit for the patient. So if they're going on to their cell phone and looking for an app for our, um, to access their medical records, what kind of app are they looking for? And do they necessarily even understand, you know, what a health information network or what a health information exchange is? Would they come to us for that knowledge or would they go to their providers? Or conversely, would they go to someone that they already trust? Like for example, Apple Health, who um, they already are very familiar with because a lot of people, you know, use their smartphones um, to get some of that content. So. Has that been something that you have also um, discussed within your organizations, or has it been something that you've heard from your stakeholders? For, at IHI, that's something that we've certainly discussed and been actively working with. When we think about getting patients access to their data, um, it includes making that data available in a form or format that they may need. So we often think about perhaps uh, partnering with a third party app vendor or otherwise. So they have uh, their, their own PHR or otherwise on their device. But viewing patient access almost a little bit more broadly where um, I will fully admit, I, I'm trained as a lawyer. Um, I have absolutely no medical competency what, whatsoever. Uh, if I receive information and I look at it on my phone, I have that information, but what I really need is I want that information to be not only accessible to me, but accessible to those organizations or individuals who can help me to utilize that information. And that may be within a healthcare organization or uh, an approach that IHI has been actively looking into and working with is community partnerships. So going and partnering with wraparound services. Uh, your, your food banks, your community health centers, et cetera. It's not just can I, that patient have access to their information on their choice of device, but can you make sure that that patient's access to information, that that information is made available per the patient's directive to those who can help that patient with their care? So really making sure that it doesn't, we're not just creating another silo of data on their, their smartphones. Yeah, and you bring up this concept of almost like consumer mediated exchange where the patient can direct mm -hmm. their health information to um, a third party or to where they want it to go. So that is something that um, definitely is, it makes sense. And it's, I think, a very natural fit when you say, as a patient, I want my information to go from one provider to another provider. Do either of you have a opinion or a perspective on uh, slightly different situation where the consumer is saying, I don't want you to necessarily send my health information to another provider. However, I want you to send my health information to um, a third party, like maybe a lawyer, um, maybe a family member, uh, maybe a um, social services agency or something like that hasn't um, typically been considered a covered entity. How has um, your organization or maybe even just your um, healthcare landscape in the region that you live kind of handled some of those questions. Is that something that you're currently um, able to accommodate or is that something that usually happens more at the provider level? In our case, it would be provider level. Yes, it would probably be something that would go through the health information exchange, but that type of conversation would take place at the provider. 
Yeah, same with IHI. We operate under the, the model of we are data stewards from our healthcare providers, our covered entities, our community health partners, or other data sources. Um, our governance framework enables us to do what they ask us to do, and that can be fluid by design. It, it's expanding to enable many of those uses, but um, it's certainly not unilaterally driven by IHI's decision, but what our membership and our data partners want the data to be, uh, how best to utilize it. Yeah, that makes sense. We at MyHIN had um, developed a service a few years ago called Statewide Consumer Directory, and it was essentially a way for um, patients themselves to log into a portal and say, I want you to share my information with these providers or these entities, or um, eventually with um, family members as well. And I think the appeal of developing something where patients could say, I want you to share this with my family members was very strong and there was a lot of interest there. However, our biggest concern was always identity verification and how we could really ensure that information was going through the right source in a really protected manner. Um, so that was something that kind of um, made that product uh, or service just a little bit ahead of its time because we hadn't been able to solve that problem. And it's something that I think that we still um, discuss a lot today is this concept of identity verification. I'm curious, Shreya, when, when, that, when you put that in place, what was the uptake? What was the, uh, how many patients took advantage of the ability to do that? Did you see a, well, you, you said strong interest, but did you see a lot of people do this? Well, actually, we never even reached um, pilot phase. It just was something that at that point um, didn't garner enough interest or, um, you know, just wasn't really able to put into implementation. That right. being said, we have been revisiting the concept of the statewide consumer directory this year because it does tie so well into all of these new initiatives, and it could be something that could really help um, some of our stakeholders in Michigan comply with these um, rural compliance periods that are coming up. It, those, types of, those types of products absolutely bring incredible value, but it also then, again, uh, there's bubbles coming out of the prototype where you're going, we have to think of new ways to address privacy and security um, mm -hmm. to one, just comply with law, but also to the fundamental issue of patients have to trust us. Um, our yeah. healthcare providers, others have to trust. And if they don't have trust in the, the processes, the, the product or otherwise, then adoption is going to be very limited, even if it's incredibly bright and shiny. And so I know on our side, trying to reconcile many of the privacy and security requirements with the forward thinking policies has been a challenge. I anticipate that it will continue to be so for a lot of organizations, not just HINs, but providers and others. Yeah, and I'm really glad that you brought up the idea of trust because um, I think that kind of helps us lead into our next question. I think a lot of the discussion that we're having right now will kind of spill over into the next um, question as well. So, um, Nick, could you just advance one more slide over? So kind of related to patient access is this question of patient autonomy and how healthcare consumers can dictate how their information is exchanged across the healthcare space, whether that's within their state or even across state lines. And very related to that topic is if, um, when, and how patients are able to opt out of health information exchange. So I really wanted to ask the two of you um, to kind of go into what your policies are surrounding opt-in or opt-out, or how do you accommodate these requests currently um, within your space? Please start. I am, um, well, first of all, I think it's a great question. And the title of our discussion today is bioethics, but I think this is more a matter of law than, than bioethics. So, so we're, we're, I think all HIEs are able to really protect the privacy and security of their patients' data, um, not only because it's the ethical right thing to do, but also that's the law. So, so, so um, Pennsylvania is an opt-out state, so uh, patient data sharing is considered approved unless the patient opts out. We allow patients to opt out from sharing either at their provider, whenever they see their doctor or hospital. So when it, if they opt out of data sharing there, then that goes to HSX and we then will not further share that patient's data with any of the other providers. 
patients can also opt out at HSX itself. So we will accept the opt out either from our member organizations or directly to HSX. Either way, we'll set the opt out flag. Um, we're high trust certified as the highest level of certification we can get for security and privacy protection for our patients, both in a technical way, but also for our staff, our processes, everything is, is considered as part of high trust certification. Um, we also, I think, do this through, and I, I bet you that most HIEs do this through a very, very strong set of agreements, data use agreements for their data participation agreement. So for every participating organization that they agree to a set of agreements to only use the data for the provision of care or a few other predefined um, appropriate use cases like population health and uh, today um, COVID pandemic control. So that I think also really helps clarify the role of an HIE on a very limited set of use cases that are also intended to protect the patient's um, privacy and security. Um, during the COVID time, of course, I think most HIEs were uh, under the HIE waiver, the HIPAA waiver, so it temporarily allowed us to share data um, more freely and more frequently with public health agencies only. So, so we did take advantage of the HIPAA waiver, but other than that, I think we're very, very um, specific on maintaining and, and uh, the patient's privacy and following the patient's opt-out instructions. So, Simon, what do you think? And I hide. Uh, no, I would agree. It, it, it's a it's a fine balance that uh, HINs have found themselves in, and we have similar policies to yours. Where if a patient wants to uh, opt out of their exchange, then it typically occurs at the provider level. And uh, while arguably somewhat cumbersome, we are firm believers in one. They are able to verify. Uh, again, that trust and identity, uh, someone just calling me over the phone and it happens, uh, you know, on occasion, please stop exchanging my data. Um, this is where it may sound like I'm wearing a tinfoil hat, but I don't have a way to verify uh, over the phone or you send me a letter and signing it. I don't, I can't verify that you are who you are. Um, and so there's, there's concern and there's been questions in the past around nefarious actors. Um, so we really feel that the providers are in the best position to be able to make that determination with the patient saying, please do not exchange my information. We also like it to occur at the provider level because we have had instances where there's been uh, sensitivity around that information from one provider where they don't want the particular lab results or the particular PHI with provider A entering into the larger health information ecosphere, but they do want other information from provider B to enter that ecosphere. And so um, I, there's, while it's a process we're all constantly trying to refine, uh, we try and maintain the patient autonomy to dictate what is or isn't allowed into the ecosphere through the provider relationship. Uh, and, and, and I concur with um, the, everything that you both have said, and our, and our policy is very similar as well. Um, what we have tried to do over the past few months is really try to expand the knowledge transfer um, that we give to our stakeholders and the knowledge transfer that we give to patients that view our website on what opt-out means and, and when you're able to do it. So, for example, I think that sometimes um, individuals might say, oh, yeah, I want to opt out of all health information exchange. But then when you let them know what opting out truly means in the context of different scenarios that could happen, particularly in emergency situations, they say, nope, you're right, that makes sense. I don't want to opt out. The kind of ethical questions that we have been faced with, though, relating to opt out are first, um, do health information exchange or health information networks have a responsibility to have a direct way for patients to come to us and say that I want to opt out of health information um, exchange across your network. And the reason I ask that question is just because we are really uniquely positioned um, 
within the state because we are connected to so many different entities that might have their information that we might be routing their information for. But then the second question that um, we always have as well is who is providing this knowledge transfer to the patients? For example, like I said, a lot of patients don't necessarily know what a health information network or a health information exchange is per se. Um, so they're not going to really be going to, you know, myhin.org to figure out how their information is being used. They're more likely to go to their um, provider, but how do we know what information um, their provider is really giving them on health information exchange? Like, do they have the knowledge that they need to really explain these different scenarios to patients? And so we kind of have these ethical conundrums all the time of, okay, well, what is the best outcome for the patient, what's the easiest for the patient, and how can we help support that, but also do so in a way that makes sense and um, also makes sense in the way that HIEs and HINs function. So th those are great questions. I, I think uh, a constant challenge or uh, goal that we have at IHI is helping the evolving provider space to one, understand what we do and how we can serve them. So they are able to have those conversations with their patients. Uh, if the frontline providers don't have a, an understanding of the role that an HIN plays, then it's very difficult for them to then convey that message to a patient or when they're having those conversations. And so we've really tried to actively through our, our customer relations teams and otherwise really try and help in our providers tell the story of health information exchange and why that benefits them. So um, when they're able to see that comprehensive record across uh, the various institutions, helping the patient to appreciate, no, we're able to see this because of you're, you know, we're part of this health information network. Uh, the reason you didn't have to fill out another form was because we already had this information because we're part of a health information network. So it's, it's helping to tell the story to not only providers, but to patients through those relationships. Absolutely, that makes sense. Um, Dr. Shapiro, do you have anything else that you wanna add um, before we move on to the next question? Um, uh, no, I think this is a good discussion. Let's move on to the next slide. Nothing new here. Perfect. Yep. Just in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next one, um, a big especially topic. because it is such a, a timely topic um, and a big uh, topic of conversation in the healthcare space right now. So currently, the priority in the healthcare space is around COVID-19, and I just wanted to ask a really general question on if your HIE has participated in the COVID response, and if so, um, how have they been uh, participating? So IHI I has certainly been, we, we've been very, very active like other HINs in the, the COVID response. Um, I, I won't go into kind of a laundry list of the, the different projects that, that we've been doing, but I would, I would capture them from a, a high level of really trying to, and we were already very active as a public health partner with the Indiana State Department of Health, a lot of our local state departments as well, uh, health departments as well as at, at a national level, really trying to emphasize, one, the need for uh, accuracy of COVID data, as well as then accessibility uh, in near real time. And so the, the pandemic seemed to speed up everything. And so what became very apparent is one, there, was, there are multiple, multiple data silos. And IHI was able to, in concert with partners at the Regan Street Institute and our state health department, make sure that silos were connected and provide uh, dashboards with near real-time information to decision makers as to what's happening. So that, that was kind of our initial phase of let's really dig in and provide a rather deep analytical levels of what's going on with COVID. And more recently, IHI is actively working with the state in helping to make sure, again, that those data silos of vaccination sites that we will be able to, in near real time, push out to providers through our software applications. Provider can open up one of our applications and see if that patient has received the vaccine. Uh, 
and as well as then potentially working with on a broader public health surveillance where there may be uh, you know, deserts of individuals who are not getting the vaccine. So we're, we're really excited, one, for the vaccine, two, for the frontline providers that are helping with that, and three, giving them near real-time access to data to support it. Yeah, the COVID, of course, has been a tremendous uh, challenge and an opportunity for health information exchanges. We, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, realized that we would be in a unique position to start reporting on data to all of our stakeholders, to all the um, providers and health organizations in the region. So we're, we're still pushing out every week a, a report with the most recent stats on COVID-19. Um, and um, I agree with Amon, it exposes our silos, our fragmentation. I think it becomes very clear that it sounds so obvious to say COVID data, but COVID data comes in pieces all over the place and you really have, as an HA, you have to I would say cobble together the various data sources into a one consistent report. And that's been very, very challenging, both on the lab result and, and, and uh, diagnostic side. And now also on the vaccination side, we're seeing that vaccination data is also not one thing. It is many things that you need to bring together into one consistent data source. Um, so we do a lot of COVID notification. We have an encounter notification specifically for COVID. So any patient who has a COVID result or a COVID ICD-10 code uh, triggers a notification to that patient's primary care doctor or to their ACO or to their care management team. So, so to make, make sure that people are early aware of patients who are uh, suffering from COVID. We were also honored to be one of the five health information exchanges in the country to receive an ONC STAR HIE. Um, award that is a, um, a grant to help and promote the sharing of data between the health information exchange and public health agencies. So through that grant, we share data with the Philadelphia Department of Public Health and with our surrounding counties, Montgomery, Chester, um, Bucks, Delaware counties, offices of public health to help them all in their COVID tracking and in their contact tracing. The purpose of that grant is also, it is of course, to promote data sharing. It is also to uh, build additional data sources that are currently not yet connected. And um, the end goal is to develop a series of APIs, application program interfaces that help exchange data more efficiently. We see today often that data is being exchanged through files in fairly simple formats. We believe, and the, the purpose of this grant is to make that more modern and more efficient and more effective and more timely so that we can do a much better job in exchanging data between HIEs and public health agencies. Um, so it's been, COVID has been an incredible exercise for all HIEs, including HSX. I think um, we learned a lot. What I also, what we, our members, whenever we have COVID discussions, what they emphasize to us, and I think it's important, is while it's totally the topic of focus right now, the the interest in vaccinations will not go away. Once we're done with COVID, we still want those connections for flu shots, for Pneumovax, for any other vaccination. So, so it's not a one-time thing that will then fade in the background. I think anything we invest today in doing a better job in communicating disease information and vaccination information is valuable in the long run. And that's why it's good to do it right now. I, I can't agree more. That, that genuinely, especially with the idea of what do we do after uh, the pandemic? And that'll, that, that's a, a wonderful question, and I look forward to that day, and hopefully there's, we're, we're not too far from that. But I, I can, speaking from the, the legal and policy and privacy perspective, uh, the, the questions that we've had to grapple with uh, are truly unprecedented. The, the privacy and legal frameworks that have historically existed within public health uh, and this is not a, a criticism, but they were not designed for the technology environment in which we operate and for many of the unique elements that this pandemic introduced. And so uh, from an ethical perspective, at least, and surely illegal, I, I'm optimistic and hopeful that we will revisit many of our public health laws, many of our federal laws in how we can utilize data and how it can serve that public health goal. I love the idea of 
you know, and it's something we've been working in. And, you know, the, the famous adage of, you know, because, again, I went to school in Iowa, but if you build it, they will come. If you build these APIs, we need to have them ready, but there has to be a legal and privacy framework that supports the exchange of the data through that incredibly fast and efficient yeah, the, the efficiency you get with the APIs, but our, our laws are, are due for, for some updating. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree with that um, point, Ammon. So what I, what I feel like we saw in Michigan is a lot of our existing services and products were um, already in place that could help with um, some of this pandemic response. For example, um, you know, just tracking ADP messages, our immunizations, these cases, and other services that we had in existence. The big challenge that we did have um, was this emphasis on public health data or population level data, because a lot of our use cases were kind of built for individual level data and it, for it to be specific to coordinate, coordinating one individual's care. Now that we're moving to this pandemic response and seeing how we can kind of assist in these efforts, we had to say, okay, no, we're not just interested in um, coordinating this individual care. Of course, that's still going to be a big thing that we want to focus on, but also how can we work with maybe our Department of Health and Human Services to do some of these um, population level um, resources or create that. For example, um, can we use the identified information to um, put together heat maps? Can we use the identified information to perhaps track bed counts across the state and do things like that? And I absolutely agree that while this is something that we're dealing with in this year, I don't think that any of those questions um, are going to go away. And I think that those will um, potentially be solutions um, for the future as well. Um, but just wondering if, you know, that was also something that you um, saw within your jurisdictions is this question of how do we move from, you know, coordinating individual level data to, um, you know, population level or public health data. We certainly had to address that with IHI, where one supporting the, the state in, well, public health departments across the state in helping to make sure that that individual data could be moved quickly and efficiently, where previously maybe there wasn't a huge stress on their networks or systems because it was really individual based. It, it wasn't focusing on a population health level, but suddenly when you are trying to look at mass vaccinations, uh, it puts an entire new strain and demand for resources that systems may not have been built for or public health epidemiology may have been constructed around the idea of uh, looking back towards historical trends versus, to your point, the need for heat maps of real-time or near, near real-time data flow so we understand not historically what happened, but what's happening in the moment. And that requires a, a different type of infrastructure and process than treating public health or immunization as an individual activity. Yep, understood, absolutely. And then um, Dr. Shapiro, before I move on, I know that one thing that you mentioned was um, contact tracing. And I was wondering if that is something that uh, your HIE has um, thought about participating in or um, is currently participating in. And the reason that I bring that up is I'm, from the bioethics side and from, you know, kind of the patient education side, what I'm wondering is if we were to coordinate that information, maybe with um, a Department of Health and Human Services at a state level, how do we inform consumers on how their COVID information is getting used? Now, is that going to be something that might be the responsibility of the provider to maybe put in their notice of privacy practices? Um, is that something, you know, that we just post publicly to um, a website and a privacy policy? Or, you know, has there been any um, conversations around the ethics of moving forward with a path like that? Yeah. Um, uh, so we, HSX, provide COVID results and COVID data to our public health agencies, and they are they will be the ones then contacting. So it really is for us to we we I wouldn't consider we are doing the contact tracing. We are providing data to help the contact trace teams to do their jobs. And I am 
So the most interesting thing we're learning from that is, you know what the most important data field is that they pull out of our data? It's the patient's phone number or the person's phone number. Uh, wow. And I'm not proud to tell you this because it means that through an HSX, most likely through a health information exchange, we probably have, most likely have the best patient's phone number because they're most recent contact with a healthcare provider. So, so therefore, it seems like if, if there's ever one way to find the patient's most recent appropriate contact information, it's through HSX. So that is not why a health information exchange was built to have a very good database of patient phone numbers. Of course, we really want to be able to be used for clinical data, but that is one of the strongest use cases. Beyond that, though, is we provide lab results, ICD-10 codes, and other indicators of uh, patient's COVID status. Um, like I said, it's, um, it's an area that needs more improvement. Um, we provide data through various formats. That format delivery can also be improved. We're, we're trying to make it more frequent. We're trying to make it more um, uh, applicable and easy for the contract tracer to use the data. But again, we are not the ones doing the contract tracing. We're providing it to our city and county um, public health departments for their contact tracing initi initiatives. Sure, that makes sense. And, and definitely uh, makes sense when you think about the role of the HIE in the space. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your insight on that. And then um, I think that we will just move on to the next and final question, just so that we do leave time um, for a little bit of a question and answer period if um, any of the attendees have them. So the last one um, is also timely because the compliance period is coming up. Um, however, information blocking compliance is gonna be again on April 5th, uh, 2021. And one question that we want to have is, how's your HIE handling information blocking compliance? And um, if you don't mind, it might also be helpful to just talk a little bit about what your initial thoughts were on the information blocking rule when it came out. Was this something that was truly a um, shock to your organization? Was it something that inherently um, was going to change the way that it was functioning? Or was it more an instance where, um, you know, we kind of already were um, participating in these um, best practices of sharing information, and we just wanted to make sure that we were documenting, you know, those few exceptions or those few instances um, where information wouldn't be shared. And um, Ammon, maybe we'll start with you again. Sure. So, um... There's a, an adage of uh, how do you eat an elephant? Answer one bite at a time. Uh, that's been kind of our motto with information blocking. It, it's an incredibly large and comprehensive uh, set of rules and genuinely is industry changing. Um, I, what's really, I think, started to hit home with a lot of organizations around information blocking. And it's something that I, I certainly felt that we have preached within IHI as well as in discussions with our, uh, our, our membership is we've operated for some 20, 21 years, depending on when you want to measure from when HIPAA started, under the, the fundamental assumption and culture that information may be exchanged. Uh, it was encouraged at times, but it, it was made. There was no compulsory requirement under HIPAA that data had to be exchanged. So we had an entire privacy and security framework and culture evolve out of HIPAA that continuously has evolved. Information blocking fundamentally changes that. It's the other bookend to HIPAA where the rule expressly says we're not trying to change. It doesn't change HIPAA, but it certainly changes the culture that HIPAA has instilled that we have now moved from a may I exchange data to I must exchange electronic health information unless I have an exception. And so for me, one of the, the biggest impacts of information blocking is trying to coordinate and understand that we are really at a, a cultural shift uh, where we can say, yeah, you still have HIPAA, but uh, the, the rules have changed culturally. And so that's been part of our compliance is working with our membership and trying to help them understand that uh, this is really a brand new area. There is a lot that is unsettled underneath information blocking and lots and lots of questions that remain unanswered. And so our, our strategy around compliance is we want to comply with the rule, obviously. It's an intent-based 
uh, regulation, and we've been putting in place policies and procedures and actively modifying our membership agreement to change this. But fundamentally, keeping in mind that this rule is not yet settled. Uh, we have FAQs still being published. We don't even have the OIG enforcement regulations yet that will apply for HINs and L HIT developers. And so it's one where we've said, we have put resources in this to comply and move forward, but to be cautious in uh, not having a sufficient flexibility to one, maintain our mission, two, serve our communities, and three, not put in place mechanisms that are going to restrain us because we overreached in thinking and guessing and trying to say, this is what we think information might be, information might, blocking might be, if we think A, B, and C. Uh, we've got to be fluid in how we approach this. That, that well said, Anne, and, and I agree that the, all the points you make, this is very much a work in progress, and at the same time, a huge step forward. Um, that, that is about to happen in April. Um, I, I, we feel at HSX that the Cures Act and the conditions of participation both really help promote the mission of interoperability. So in a, in a way, this is a lot of wind in our sails to, to get that support and um, um, through these regulations. So that helps. We also feel that many of our members, merely by participating in HSX, already are in compliance by encounter net notification, which we handle through HSX, and, and by information blocking when we receive a patient's CCDs and are able to share that with other providers. So I, I think um, we see ourselves as a, as a uh, mechanism and as a tool, as an organization, to help our members be in compliance with these rules. Um, an interesting thing that I'm kind of keeping an eye out is the part of the information blocking rule is the US CDI, the core data for interoperability. The definition that when you exchange data, when we say information blocking or, or interoperability, this is the data set we mean. Um, and there currently is a you know, very well-defined list of data. If you look today at what EHRs share, with each other and with health and with health information exchanges, that is more or less already on the USCDI, except for one big category. It's the notes. The notes are included in the USCDI. So the patient notes, the visit note, the op note, whatever note, the discharge note. And I find in 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 my you know constituency, the doctors who use HSX, if there's one thing they want to see, it's the note. Uh, yes, I want to see the IC10 code or the problem list or the mess, but I really want to see the note. And so I'm very happy to see that the US CDI states that the notes are included and therefore in information blocking, we should expect that many of these organizations who have been sharing CCDs all along now need to also include the notes into those CCDs. That will do a couple of things. It will make these CCDs very, very, very big. Um, that's a whole different challenge that we need to somehow work on and make them still manageable but it will start the exchange and sharing of notes. And while it's narrative data, it doesn't really do much good for analytics. For patient care, it is probably the most valuable piece of information. And I'm very happy to see that included in the, uh, in the Cures Act and in the information blocking rules. And I, I think that's actually a great point, kind of looking at the opposite side of, of information blocking is, um, once you start including something that might make a message very, very, very long, does it lose um, some of its impact because, you know, providers might not be able to absorb all the uh, material in it. So um, definitely really true. Appreciate yeah. Yeah. We're going to go from not enough to too much and, and we'll have to find a way to deal with that too. But that's, you know, in the IT industry, that's what we do. We first create a problem and then we solve it. And then by solving it, we create the <laughs> next one. So I feel this is just us creating the next problem, which is too much information but I'm very, still very happy that it's now being shared. I, I'm Perfect. just glad to hear that I've always assumed that lawyers were both the cause and solution to 99% of the problem. So I, I'm just glad to hear that we're, we're not <laughs> the only one. True. Definitely. Well, thank you both so much for your perspective on that. Um, I know that we only have 10 more minutes um, left on the hour. So I think that I am going to open it up um, to questions from the audience. But before we ask individuals to come off mute and ask them, um, I do see a few of them right here in the chat. So maybe we can kind of run through a few of these ones um, to start. And the first one looks like it came um, from Lonnie who asked, 
What about the ability of patients to provide a revocable code that allows a third party to access um, their information through a HIN? And for this one, um, I definitely want to get um, Ammon and, and Dr. Shapiro's uh, feedback, but maybe I can start um, with this uh, question from the MyHIN perspective. So I think that it is a good idea um, to allow some sort of code or um, avenue in which third parties are able to receive um, information that patients want them to receive. I think that one thing that we have to um, be careful of or, or maybe a limitation on health information exchanges is even if we did completely accommodate this process, um, the third party wouldn't necessarily be able to access the information through us as the health information network. Instead, what would probably be a solution is we would be able to accommodate some sort of query um, situation where we're querying a certain provider and saying, will you send this to a third party? And the reason for that is because MyHIN um, doesn't really store any information. We keep it for a limited period of time just for quality purposes, but typically we just route it from point A to point B. So if we did receive, um, you know, these requests of um, would you route my healthcare information to a third party um, and, and us as a HIN were to accommodate that situation, um, we would probably be doing something where we're more acting like a broker as opposed to um, actually being the entity that's um, routing that or disseminating that information um, to that third party. But um, I'll open it up to, to Ammon and Dr. Shapur um, to see if you have any thoughts on that question as well. A uh, uh, great question. I, I think uh, one, and it's it's a ideal practice. It's something that I know that the industry has discussed and moving towards. One of the challenges I think there is health information networks traditionally have not operated in the space of needing individual authorization underneath HIPAA. Uh, they've typically operated under the realm of treatment, payment, healthcare operations, public health, research, et cetera, where um, in addition to that code, you would really need to build uh, some mechanisms around individual authorization for that data to actually leave the, the HIN. Um, and that also then kind of depends on whether HINs are even then permitted by their members to release the data for this particular purpose. So again, it kind of comes back to information blocking as well as uh, HINs are business associates of their membership and they are not allowed to do anything outside of what their membership agreements state, provided that it's non-discriminatory. And so uh, it, it gets to, again, kind of that shift of moving from that historical model underneath HIPAA to a new world underneath information blocking where the need to operationalize these types of practices um, are the future, but it's gonna take some time to balance the privacy, security, and tech requirements. I think Evan, you said it all. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that feedback, um, that's great. Another question that we got is, it sounds like the fundamental problem is a lack of a direct relationship between the health information exchanges and their patients. Um, so the HIE kind of consolidates information from all the patients and providers, but the patient may not be aware of all the frontline providers and all the information that is out there. They can't curate their own information. Often they can't even see it. Um, and, and I would be really interested um, to maybe hear from Ammon or, or Dr. Sherpair on your thoughts on this, um, especially in respect to what we've seen from the more recent drafts of TEFCA and how you see that um, TEFCA does start to introduce the patient into the health information exchange landscape when you kind of look at some of those lower um, tiers of exchange, um, they actually have individual participants um, listed right there on the diagram with, you know, providers and payers themselves. So what are your thoughts on, you know, kind of introducing the patient into this um, space? Or do you think that it does make more sense to kind of keep it as status quo the way it is, where it's us, you know, merely coordinating care for our stakeholders and not directly with patients themselves? This is harm. Uh, I have to think about that concept. Um, of course, I'm very used to the current state where the relationship is between the patient and the provider. And in many ways, that's a good thing. 
that's also where they can opt out of data sharing. That's where they can receive their data. I feel that that is the appropriate place for, for that interaction to take place. Um, and and um, while I could see that there will be frameworks, networks, apps that will start aggregating that data for the patient, I think that is that is not necessarily the role of the HIE organization itself. I see I feel that it's either being would be handled by the healthcare provider themselves or by some other organization um, company, third party, with whom the patient interact. I don't see today that there is the both the uh, the um, capability and 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 whether the the ability to serve patients really well by setting up directly with the HIE and in many ways overlapping them with the work that our providers themselves would do. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think it's it's a fantastic question and it's, a, it's a, a beautiful objective. I think that there are some hurdles that we are still trying to understand how to not only operationalize it, but what does the, the relationship look like between an HIE, a patient, and their physician? So, for example, um, I, taking it to the information blocking world, uh, one of the exceptions where a data does not have to be disclosed is if they're the, the harm exception. Um, you know, as a health information exchange, I, I would get I get concerned because we are not healthcare providers. We're not in that role to be able to say this data may be harmful, this data may not be harmful. Um, what I don't want to do is create an alternative channel or a means that would somehow uh, undermine or frustrate the provider-patient relationship. So you know, the, the ideal world to me would be uh, the patient has access to the in information in a way that they think is convenient, independent of whether that comes through the HIE, the provider, or through the, the nexus of that relationship. And then um, I know we only have one minute, but I did want to get to um, the last question that we had in the chat um, from Dan, who asked, can someone speak to what the feds are doing about the practice of information blocking by making access to the data costly? Small providers are usually charged the same monetary amount for interfaces that a large health system is charged. And um, please feel free to, to correct me if I misspeak, but it was my understanding on reading of the rule that one thing um, that it prevented against was discriminatory pricing. So the size of the entity should actually be um, taken into account. And um, there's also this notion of you know, not charging um, too much beyond what it actually costs um, as well. So I know that there was a little bit of language in the information blocking rule, um, but not sure if any of you have um, greater insight on that um, so that we can clarify um, some of those parameters. Yeah, I, I would echo your, your comments. The, the fees exception as well as when we're looking at what I would call the alternative manner uh, underneath the, the content manner exception, fees exception, and, and license exception, really get into when fees can be charged. And a reoccurring theme that we see is uh, the fees, the fees exception where there is not data, where you do not come to an agreement, those fees that were offered and then rejected must have complied with that fees exception, principally being that similarly situated organizations um, are charged the, the same amount. Now, there's lots of caveats and lots of commentary about what goes into those fees, but I, my understanding of the rules is there is a fundamental purpose that uh, you can't charge two organizations that are vastly uh, different the same rate without sufficient justification. If you don't, you better have documentation if uh, you find yourself in that position where you're charging everybody the same rate. Not saying it can't happen, but you need to have documentation to support it. Perfect. Thanks so much for that. And I know that we're um, right about to be over. So I just wanted to, again, thank the panelists uh, so much for being able to attend and participating in this webinar. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, Dan, I will follow up with you after the webinar just to give you a little more um, information on what the language actually says. And we can definitely take that conversation offline as well. So thanks everyone for joining and have a good one. Thank you, everybody.